Paco, thank you for joining us today for our Where's That Mosquitoes outreach to um, outreach professionals and others who are interested in learning a little bit of more about our program and um, what our different partnerships are doing to save the native birds here in Hawaii. Um, today we have with us uh, Tia Penniman, who is the project coordinator for Birds Out Mosquitoes. We have Dr. Lisa Crampton, who is also the project director for Hawaii Forest Bird Recovery Project. And then um, Julia, um, who also does the outreach and helps out with the Kauai Forest Bird Recovery Project. Um, so we started off with a question um, prior to recording, asking to use two to three words to describe messages that we may have already heard about birds and mosquitoes. And what we came back was that it's an urgent need that it's safe, that it has been um, used for human health. And um, that our first, I think the last one was, let me go back to the tab, was that, yep, the it's urgent and the mosquitoes are killing our native bird, forest birds. Hmm. Anyways, I would like to start with um, Lisa, uh, not Lisa, sorry, Callie. I look at your little name tag at the bottom. Let's start with um, Callie. And she's going to take us over to Kauai and give us a little bit of background on the birds, um, what their project is doing, and how we are moving forward with protecting our birds on Kauai. Thank you. Thank you, and aloha. And Susan, it's good to see you again. Um, so, so today, um, Susan, and I'm going to take a few minutes to go over what the Birds Not Mosquitoes project is and, 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 and why we're doing this to protect the birds. And then we are going to have a discussion about what people trying to help us get the word out would like to know more in depth about. Uh, so I, you've probably heard me speak before about Kauai's forest birds. We have eight native forest bird species remaining on Kauai out of a couple of dozen probably original songbirds on the island. Six of these birds are honeycreepers and the honeycreepers are the family that is known to be most sensitive to mosquito-borne diseases. And then two species here, the Kauaiohi, the small Kauai thrush and the uh, Kauai alapayo are not honeycreepers and actually seem to be more resistant as far as we can tell from the data to avian malaria. Six of these species are endemic to Kauai, so they're found in Kauai only, nowhere else in the world. Whereas the <clears throat> Apapane and the EEV are found throughout the Hawaiian Islands, not just uh, on Kauai only. And these birds are part of the larger group of species known as the Hawaiian honeycreepers that are found in these islands and that are an example of an adaptive radiation from a single ancestor. So a long, long time ago, a rose finch was blown off course, a couple, probably several rose finches were blown off course, and <clears throat> that ancestor became more than 50 different species of Hawaiian honeycreeper that evolved to have all these different colors and all these different beak shapes and fill all these different ecological roles uh, from that one ancestor. And it is this particular group of species that is so sensitive to mosquito-borne diseases because they have no evolutionary history with that. And as you know, um, because Cal Amy takes a special, does somebody want to? Because Cal Amy takes special pride in adorning um, themselves with with feathers to, you know, reinforce the ties that we humans have with the celestial importance of, of, the, of the forest birds, um, there are tremendous longstanding cultural relationships between the Hawaiian people and the forest birds. And of course, there are really deep ecological relationships between the forest birds and the forests where the forest birds provide pollination services, seed dispersal and insect control. And Really, without the birds, without the forest, obviously there are no forest birds. I mean, the, the birds need the forest to live in. But honestly, it goes the other way as well. Without the birds, there is no forest because there would be no regeneration of the forest. There would be no pollination of the flowers. There would be no dispersal of the seeds. There would be uh, 
you know, insect control. And without forests, of course, the Hawaiian islands would just basically collapse in a big mudslide into the Pacific Ocean. So the birds are an integral part of our culture and of our ecosystems and everything that sustains life in the Hawaiian Islands. Here on Kauai, we have three endangered species of forest bird. The puayohi or small kauai thrush, as I said earlier, is not part of that honey creeper family. It numbers about 500 individuals. The populations seem to be quite stable. The akikiki numbers fewer than 500 individuals. And by some estimates, recent estimates, it numbers even fewer than 100 individuals. And I'm not sure if you were part of what we shared at Kukiolono in the spring. We are very, very worried about this species. Uh, and then the akeke uh, is about 1,000 individuals. And these birds are found only here um, on Kauai. The, these two, the akikiki and the akeke are honey creepers and they eat insects. So there are many, many threats to the forest birds persistence. A long time ago, we started clearing the forests. So they've lost a lot of habitat. The forests continue to be degraded by the invasion of native, non-native plants and animals, such as Himalayan ginger and Australian tree fern and blackberry which are often carried and spread by ungulates, but also by the wind. A newcomer on the scene is Rapidohia death, which is a fungus that kills uh, ohia. And honestly, that ohia is what keeps the birds going. So once or if Rapidohia death manages to make it into the alaka'i, the birds will likely suffer. To date, we've only detected Rapidohia death on Kauai in Koke'e in mixed, fairly invaded forests. We have not found it in pristine Ohia forests, so we are fingers crossed that our pristine forests will resist this disease. Introduced predators, especially rats, prey on forest bird nests, and in doing so, they often remove or kill the female. Uh, so these are a really big threat, especially to the Elapayo and the Puayohi. And then the major topic here is mosquito-borne diseases, which are transmitted by the southern house mosquito or Culex quinquefasciatus. There are two main mosquito-borne diseases, avian malaria and avian pox. So avian pox is shown over here in this left photo. It causes necrosis of the non-feathered parts of the birds, like their feet, their beak, and their eyes and render them unable to perch for, where you know, birds perch for safety or to roost at night um, or even to eat. <clears throat> but the main issue is that female mosquitoes, when they, and, and you probably know that only female mosquitoes bite, uh, when, they, when they bite animals trying to get a blood meal, they transmit uh, avian malaria through the blood. And avian malaria has proven highly, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Deadly, I guess is the word I'm looking for, to the honeycreeper family. For example, EEV, nine out of 10 EEV will die if they are bitten one time by a female mosquito carrying avian malaria. So, very, very susceptible group of, of birds. And I keep saying the word female because it really is important to note for the rest of my story that it is the females that bite and the females that transmit disease because they are looking for blood meals so that their eggs can develop. Yeah. And males, male mosquitoes do not bite. Male mosquitoes, in fact, are only trying to find nectar to feed themselves and find females so that they can reproduce. There's a relationship between both avian malaria and mosquitoes and temperature. Neither avian malaria nor mosquitoes like cool temperatures. So up until very recently, mosquitoes have been trapped by the cold weather in our mountain areas to areas closer to the ocean. And they've just, as you know, they've done very well down here at sea level 
But whenever we and the birds go up into our mountains, we find respite from the mosquitoes because it's too cold up there for the mosquitoes to breed. And it's also too cold for avian malaria to complete its life cycle. So unfortunately, that scenario is changing because warming temperatures across the planet, including in the Hawaiian Islands, are pushing warmer temperatures further and further into our mountain areas. And so that this green area at the top of our islands is being eroded and that we no longer experience this refugium from mosquitoes. And on short islands, sh islands that are short in stature, like Kauai, this is particularly grave. So on the left-hand side is a tall island like Hawaii Island, where down here we have in yellow, we have no forests. In the middle, we have the forested zone. And up at the top, we have the area where no trees can grow because it's above the tree line. And this yellow line here, the mosquito line, cuts squarely through the forested area. So down here, you have mosquitoes and forests. And up here, you have birds and forests. On Kauai, however, we <clears throat> have next to no forested area that is above that mosquito line where birds can do well. And that was before climate change. So now with climate change, we are seeing mosquitoes even at the top of the island all the time. And we know this from our mosquito research where we, we have been sampling mosquitoes across the plateau for the last several years now. And whereas before we never caught mosquitoes in Koke and the Alakai, now we catch mosquitoes. So we know they are invading the plateau. And we know actually from other research that they are bringing malaria with them, avian malaria with them. And so unfortunately, our darling Akikiki seems to be experiencing a pandemic, much like our own pandemic, where it's dying rapidly. So this graph here on the left shows the, the probability that an Akikiki survives from one year to the next. And this is 2015 through 2021 on the axis down here. And this probability has been fairly steadily declining over that time period, where it's just less and less likely that an Akikiki survives from one year to the next, with a small exception in 2018. And we see this in other ways too. So we record the number of Akikiki territories. The Akikiki maintain little territories. You can think of it as their backyard at Halapa'akai, our main site. And when we started following them back in 2018, we were able to sort of document or map out 35 territories. This year, we were only able to map out three territories. And unfortunately, two of them were held by single males who did not have a partner. Only one male had a partner who um, nested and produced two chicks. So what are we doing about this? Well, we're doing a lot of studying, trying to figure out where the mosquitoes are in space and time. But that also that, that research also allows us to control mosquitoes out of their uh -huh. scale. So one thing we do is we remove um, mosquito, mosquitoes like to breed in stagnant water. And so one thing we can do is we can fill it. We can just fill puddles or we can remove weeds that of impound water um, when we find mosquito breeding in them. If it's too big, a, a body of water to do that, we can treat it with a, a natural insecticide that is called uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. And this is commonly known, you can buy it in your hardware store, it's commonly known as a dunk. And it is very, very specific to mosquito larvae and midge larvae. It, <clears throat> so if you put it in water, it will just prevent the larvae of those species from developing. And it doesn't affect dragonfly larvae. It doesn't affect damselfly larvae. It doesn't affect fish or humans or birds or pigs. So very safe to use. So we have been using that to control larvae where we see them. The other thing is, is that we can trap adults. So these are two different kinds of traps we use to attract female mosquitoes. And once we trap them, we can dispatch of them. But we are doing this um, back to this map at this scale, you know, we are doing it here and here and here. We're not, we can't that, and it, we are doing it for, you know, a week at a time. We can't possibly cover the whole alakai with these methods at any one time. 
And so we are turning to this new method, the mosquito birth control method that uh, Luca was talking about called Wolbachia. Uh, so Wolbachia is a bacteria that occurs naturally in many, many insects. Many, many insect species host Wolbachia. And when mosquitoes, uh, when a male mosquito and a female mosquito, female mosquito carry two different strains of Wolbachia, the Wolbachia interferes with the fertilization of the eggs and the female lays in viable eggs. So it's a form of birth control because the eggs won't hatch. So in this graphic here, we have two mosquitoes with the same strain shown in blue of Wolbachia and they produce mosquitoes carrying more Wolbachia. But down here we have two mosquitoes with different strains of Wolbachia and there's just a bunch of eggs produced that never hatch. And so the idea that we have is to inject not the males, which don't bite with a different strain of Wolbachia than the wild females in the Alakai carry, and then rear up thousands and tens of thousands of these, of these males and release them on the Alakai in sufficient quantities that there is a much, much higher chance that a wild female will encounter one of these lab-reared males with a different strain, breed with him and have inviable eggs than her encountering a wild male. And the over this, it's been proven that over time, this strategy will lead to a decrease in mosquito populations because females consistently encounter males that have different strains than, the, than they do and um, her, their eggs are inviable. So over time, the mosquito population decreases. And it's also been shown that as the mosquito population decreases, the incidence of the disease that you're trying to control decreases. So we have great hopes for this technique uh, to control avian malaria in the birds. And it's been used safely to control human diseases throughout the world. So it's a very proven technology. The group behind this is a partnership represented here by us. <laughs> How are you? Yeah. Do you mind if we take a quick break? I think um, Susan had a question. Sure. Yeah, I just had a question about that. So with the males, these uh, males that have the different um, variants, would you have to do it uh, like uh, periodically so that they, um, they it, it covers and then you have to keep going and doing it again and again in order to make them, the female mosquitoes mate with the, the different kind of male? Yes, that is true. And, and it, so it will depend a, a little bit on the time of the year and the density of wild mosquitoes, but because some fraction of females will continue to lay viable eggs, they will mate with a, a wild male and lay viable eggs, there will be some wild mosquitoes on the landscape. And so if you do not continue to release these lab reared males with the different strain, your mosquito populations will rebound again. So depending on the time of year when, it, you know, whether mosquitoes are very active and very abundant, you might have to release these lab reared mosquitoes every two weeks, every four weeks, every six weeks um, to keep this going. So it is a very, it is also an investment of, of uh, time and resources, but it can be done at a bigger scale. We can do that across the whole alakai every couple of weeks. Whereas we cannot trap mosquitoes out with our little traps <laughs> every two weeks. Yeah. So this the partnership is um, a multi-agency, state and federal, and multi um, not like lots of not-for-profit organizations, universities supporting it. It's a it's a very big and um, diverse partnership. And I'm going to let Taya speak to the timeline for this because for exactly the reasons you bring up, the number of mosquitoes involved in this, it is there's still quite a time horizon involved. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Kelly, for that great, great overview. So yes, this is um, basically the use of these mosquitoes are treated as being like a form of pesticide by the Environmental Protection Agency. And so, and also by our, our State Department of Agriculture. So there are a number of different permitting processes that we have to go through at the same time that we're figuring out how we're going to release these mosquitoes on the landscape. You're familiar with the, 
with the terrain on Kauai and some of the challenges associated with that. There's some places you could do, you can hike in and release these. Some places you might have to use things like drones or you know some other way to other way to get them out there. So where we are in our overall timeline is that this tool, this product exists. There, it, we we know there's a lab in on the mainland that has developed a strain of Culex mosquitoes, the same species that we have here, and and it's um, been back crossed, so it's basically genetically quite similar, almost identical to the mosquitoes that we have here. Um, so that exists. And then the next, one of the next steps in our processes is to get a permit from the Department of Agriculture allowing us to bring those mosquitoes back in. And we have, we have achieved one part of that through the, with the University of Hawaii. Our next phase then, once we're able to get those mosquitoes here, we don't have them here yet. Um, but once we are able to get them here, then would we, we would be doing certain trials in order to make sure that, okay, that worked in, you know, that worked in, um, in Michigan, for example, we want to make sure it works here. And so we would have cage trials where you put these incompatible males into a cage and then with wild females that we get from here in Hawaii to make sure when they breed, when they lay their eggs, they're still not viable. So we really want to be sure we want to take the time here in Hawaii to make sure that these things work. And then if we don't have any reason to believe they won't, but it's just a step that we want to go through, need to go through. And then we would also be doing small scale pilot studies in very limited areas, again, to test the technique, to put it out into the field to figure out how, you know, all the different operational details. Um, under the under the regulatory arm that we would be working out under, I mentioned the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, we would first those initial things trials that I talked about. We can't just decide to do those. We have to first have an experimental use permit from EPA. They're not going to just let us try it out in the in the open air. Um, so we have to have an emergent an experimental use permit. We may also be going for an emergency exemption under the EPA because it really is an environmental ecological emergency. The way the numbers that that yeah. Callie shared about the crashing population, some of our birds don't may not have a couple of years. You know, they may only have two years, three years, like those the like the Akikiki. Um, but longer term, what we're going for, and you see that in 2023, is an overall registration. So again, this product is treated as a pesticide, biopesticide. So it'd have to be released, really, would have to be registered as a biopesticide. Um, and then in our in our kind of optimistic view, we would then be able to start doing landscape scale releases as early as 2024. And and where those I think Callie's going to talk about the location for where where those would be done. But I'll just stop here and see if you have any questions, Susan, about any of that process. Okay. I think we can move on. Great. Thank you, Taya. Taya can always speak to the timeline better than I can. Because she's involved in all the meetings where it gets slightly adjusted and new things get added and <laughs> it's evolving itself, right? The timeline. <clears throat> so where, where I want to spend the last few minutes is just to drive home this idea that the, the koke'e and the alaka'i are the last refugia for these birds that I think, you know, we've already shown with climate change, this is the last place these few species do still remain. And so that's the area that we need to safeguard. And uh, we, so therefore we propose to use this strategy in, in that area. We propose first with our pilot releases to release mosquitoes over that area. And it will likely res re involve some kind of helicopter and or drones in the southern Alakai where there are no roads and, and just birds and, and trees and field workers like my team. And then in the Koke area where there are lots of um, cabins and trails, it will likely involve people in vehicles and on foot releasing these um, mosquitoes. And then I want to also drive home that there's a lot that we can do in the meantime while we await 
this pilot release uh, to number to protect this area, but also help advance this process. So thank you, because you're already doing number one, you're staying informed and involved. Um, we are seeking volunteers to help us with things big and small at our office and in Kuke'e, doing the research, the trapping work behind all of this. Um, but also just remember that every day that you take small steps in your own life to address climate change, you're doing something that benefits the birds because it is at the end of the day, a climate change driven phenomenon. And then um, we're gonna, I'm gonna show a couple more slides touching on each of these. Please around you, especially when you're in Kokei, reduce mosquito breeding habitat. So just a reminder that they breed in stagnant water and anything that collects even a centimeter of water will allow this mosquito to breed. And so let's talk a little bit about both those points. So one of the things you can do in the field, if you're a game and in, this, in Kokei or, or along the boardwalk or wherever is to help us find, monitor and control those larvae in water sources. So we just need people documenting where they see mosquito larvae. And if they're game, we, they can help us with those um, BTI applications in the streams. We have we're active we are actively recruiting for a SWAT team crew and we have a few volunteers already that are helping us maintain the the BTI schedule uh, on some some ditches in Koke and Alakai. And then this is some examples of how you can control the mosquito breeding habitat in and around places you might visit in Koke. These are all examples of things in which we have found larvae in our own homes and up in Kokei around the cabins. So just it's really important to not have old tarps collecting water because one centimeter is enough. Tires, guzzlers, plant trays, all those things. Turn them over or use that BTI in them or just get rid of them entirely. And with that, um, that's the end of my presentation. So thank you. More questions, and then we can also move into the next part of the of the workshop today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to leave some space for any questions for Callie and Taya before we hop on over to the next portion. Okay. Could you stop sharing? Thank you. So. There you go. My presentation is basically taking everything that Hallie and Taya said and distilling it down to what are our key messages? What are the main points that we want to make sure that is echoed as people talk from one person to the next person, just to make sure that, you know, if you ever play telephone, the message can get distorted as it moves down the line. So trying to just keep it succinct and concrete. And we always want to start off with why, like why are we doing it? And um, Birds Not Mosquitoes, all the different partnerships came together and came with this as our foundational, foundational message moving us forward. Iola na manu na hele, so that the forest birds may thrive. And everything that we do, all the different possibilities that we take into consideration, it's always the birds first and then us after. And so along with that, that very um, can be complicated um, technique, we came up with these seven main um, points. It's unique, there's an urgency, we wanna be inclusive both for our local community but really mainly for our um, the community that share a long genealogical tie with our forest birds and our forests and our native Hawaiian community to make sure we are reaching and hearing what they have to say about um, doing things in the Waokua. Also um, transparency, we wanna make sure that the public is up to date with all the different facets with the science that we are rolling out. And so that when it comes time to make a decision whether they want to support or not support, they can do this with um, the most education. Um, we are wanting to make sure that we are saying that we are using the best available science. Um, and that 
above is safety, safety for us, for humans, safety for our birds and for our environment. We don't want to create more problems. And that this technique is um, different from others that are being used to um, control pests. We aren't, no genes are being altered. None of the Wolbachia's genes and none of the mosquitoes genes. And so each slide that comes after this is just to um, drive home the key top messages from each section. So um, the unique our birds aren't found anywhere else. This is a, just as um, the Galapagos is famed for their radi adaptive radiation, the radiation that here happened in Hawaii. Um, and as Kelly was saying that the native, native forest birds are important, that without the birds, there is no forest and without the forest, we have no birds. Next is this urgency. We have to do something now. We don't have time anymore to just sit down and discuss and hope that we will find the thing that does it at 100%, yes, it's gonna work. We have to take what we know, move forward and do um, what we collectively have feel is the right thing following all the different safety guidelines and regulations that we have to meet. Oh, I went the wrong way. And then um, I wanna take a little bit more time on the mosquito birth control. So the technique is also known as the incompatible insect technique. If you want to look at it from um, across the way, this technique interrupts the re reproduction and is used to reduce mosquito populations. And so what it does is it um, goes in and it alters the sperm. And so when the um, male mosquito mates with the female that has a different Wolbachia, it causes a timing. And so the embryo isn't able to develop and the eggs don't hatch. And so this can, um, as Kelly said, that this can be done by getting a Wolbachia and transinfecting. There's also another um, process that we're looking into of a naturally occurring Wolbachia. So if we find a culex from across the world, for example, um, in Istanbul that already carries a Wolbachia strain that's incompatible with one that's here, we are looking to see of either flying in the uh, male mosquitoes that have, are already carrying it or back crossing them also with our male, with our Hawaii biotype to ensure that they are as similar to our Hawaii mosquitoes as possible. And as I said, this is a complicated, so I wanna sit here and open space for, if you have any questions and for both Kali and Taya to add anything, if I may have not come out <laughs> completely 100%. All right, I'm not hearing anything, so I'm gonna move forward. And that it is safe. It has been, um, it's safe for humans and our environments. Um, Wolbachia, not Wolbachia, mosquitoes were a recent introduction. They only came, um, the Culex only came in around 1826 um, on a whaling ship, and it's only been here for 200 years. So all of our flowers, all of our um, insectivores, they, do not rely upon mosquitoes for pollination or for their dietary needs. And so removing them from the environment will not have a detrimental effect. If anything, all it does is do positive things like having our birds have a place to live. And Wolbachia is also found in um, many creatures, uh, many insects all over the place. And it can only be transferred from mother mosquito or female mosquito to the um, offspring. So it can't be transferred from, let's say, the mosquito to myself if it bites me, or from a mosquito to opea opea if the opea opea happens to eat it. Um, it would just get digested inside the stomach. So the only way that Wolbachia can move is through um, the mother's lineage. And then um, the final point is that we will be only releasing males. And the way that we know that we are releasing males is through um, sex separation. So the eggs, um, after 
they hatch, the larva, the male and the female of the Culex mosquito are different sizes. So they can um, be easily just filtered through like a sieve and all of the um, males are caught and the females are let on. And then after they are raised to adults, there are some different morphological differences like the antennae or what their uh, rear end looks like. So AI technology can actually scan them and then just re um, check to make sure that only males are moving on down the line and are actually getting and released with us. If for some reason, removing mosquitoes does have a effect that we don't want, this process is easily reversible. All we would have to do is start releasing female mosquitoes that hold the Wolbachia within them, and then we can have mosquito populations rebound. So it is not a just one-time thing, um, one way. And these last couple of slides are just for you guys. I'm gonna share this presentation. Just a little bit more information about the Southern House mosquito and about avian malaria and the symptoms that it um, places upon our birds. And a quick little easy to print out fact sheet of our different um, five key messages and the key points underneath them. And you don't have to read it. It's a lot of text for reading something on the presentation, but this can be cut out. And yeah, that's just my short little read out. Do I have any questions? We did get some questions sent in for us, just in case um, we weren't able to make it. So I wanted to bring those up and maybe we can all add together. So what other species are closely or even remotely related to mosquitoes that this might affect? Will dragonflies or damselflies be affected? Um, I think the main thing that we really want to try to drive home is that um, there are other insects that already have Wolbachia naturally. And that whatever strain they have is passed maternally. So it really doesn't go from one um, or very, very, very rarely. It really doesn't go like in a, in a horizontal transmission. It's vertical, meaning from the female to the offspring. And um, so no. <laughs> no is the short answer. The, they're worldwide more than 60% of species of insect species in the world have this have this infection this bacteria in them in Hawaii it's not as many as more like about 14 percent as far as we know there was a very small study that was done that looked at that but but both native and non-native insects in Hawaii already carry this bacteria but it would be one that's particular to that particular insect I think that's one of the great strengths of this tool is that it is so specific yeah. I mean, it's not even, if we were to get another mosquito, we would have to do it in that other species of mosquito. It's not even gonna spread among different mosquito species. And so we are, I think, I neglected to mention, I'm not sure if Taya mentioned, we are, we are partnering with people in the Department of Health to look at using the same technology for the human diseases like dengue and Zika that are carried by different kinds of mosquitoes. Um, but that is more on the regulatory side. The bio biological side has to be de developed independently. And, and you know, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about this before, but, um, but the, 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 the strain that we're looking at bringing in um, from the, that's been developed in the, on the continent is actually from a different mosquito. And so it's from actually the tiger mosquito that we have here. So mm. it's, it's um, Wolbachia albopictus. And so because it's so different, that's why it's so solid as, a, as an effective birth control method. It's like, you know, it, it doesn't, um, yeah. Yeah, I could go into more detail about, about that, but I, but I won't. <laughs> so in the current vision, right, of the program, everything is, is even though it went to the continent for a little while, everything is made in Hawaii, right? And then coming back in the current vision, although other visions may come down the road. Yeah? I didn't, did you? Were so you right, about, now, yeah. right now they are reading, they are working with a Hawaii specific line and in, injecting a Wolbachia from another Hawaiian mosquito. Like everything right now is all Hawaii specific. Is that true? 
Right now, it's it's a little, it's slightly more complicated than that. Um, the lab in Michigan already had a line of Culex mosquitoes with this incompatible strain, um, and so they are now back. They back crossed that into. So they had a Hawaii. They they imported Hawaii mosquitoes, wild mosquitoes. They cleared the Wolbachia from them. So they give them basically they give the mosquitoes antibiotics. So no infection at all. And then they're they're um, breeding them with that that other infected Culex wine. So they didn't actually end up um, injecting the eggs of the Hawaii mosquitoes. They back crossed it with a line that already had it. But they back cross it enough times, seven, 10 generations, that essentially it's almost genetically indistinct from the Hawaii mosquitoes. And, and one of the reasons we want to do that, it's not so much that like, well, oh, yay, they're Hawaii mosquitoes, you know, because they're not really, they're not native. Um, but because we want to be sure that we're not inadvertently introducing some genetic trait from this other line of mosquitoes that would perhaps make them more cold tolerant or you know, some way that would, would make them um, more adapted to our environment here. So that, that's the main reason for making sure that they are as close to the, the Hawaii mosquitoes as we have here. Um, I have a follow-up question. <clears throat> so the, um, the avian malaria is transmitted by Culex, right? By that one species of mosquito. So if we remove this mosquito, is there any way that then avian malaria could be transmitted by a different species of mosquito? There are um, other species that can vector it, but they're very poor. They're very incompetent vectors. So, and, and the other thing is that Culex mosquitoes really like birds. They're called ornithophilic. I love that word. They love birds. They like to, they like, they don't love them the same way we do. <laughs> at least the females anyway. Um, but, but they like to feed on birds. They also will bite humans and other vertebrates. In fact, they are pretty much the only night biting mosquito in the state. We have six different species of mosquitoes that are biting here in Hawaii. There are a couple more mosquitoes that don't bite. Again, none of them native, but they're the one that if you're up at night and you've got a mosquito buzzing around your ear, driving, keeping you from sleeping, it's Culex, it's the Southern house mosquito. Mm -hmm. So I think basically we believe that if we get rid of Culex, we will solve this particular problem. Yes. No, no other mosquito is gonna suddenly jump in and start transmitting avian malaria to the birds the, the way Culex has been. Yeah, no. And it's it raising that question of human health that also this process, as we pointed out, is, is being used across the world to uh, address mosquito-borne human diseases. And there are um, folks in the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Health, who are, at, I guess, mostly Department of Health, who are actively looking at using the same technology to address the mosquitoes that we have here in Hawaii that do transmit human diseases. So um, this is the first time that we use for conservation, but we're partnering closely with the Department of Health on, on looking at using the same technique to, can you imagine having a mosquito-free Hawaii? Wouldn't that be awesome? Mm, be awesome. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. What a vision, mosquito-free Hawaii. Yeah. As oh. well as the vision of the birds in our thriving in the alaka'i and koke'e and even lower elevations, that, I, that concept of abundance. Um, I have so one. the mosquito, I'm sorry. So the mosquitoes will be the testing and the, um, the first release of these mosquitoes will be in 22? That would be the earliest, yes. Um, that would be the earliest, but but only if we have the we have to first have the mosquitoes either here or available to be shipped here, um, and we have to make we have to have all the required state and federal permits in order. Uh -huh. State permits. Yuck. Yes, <laughs> you're familiar with those. It sounds yeah. like <laughs> it's a long time. <laughs> yes, it can take a long time, all for a good reason. We don't want to. We don't want to skip any steps, but it can be, it can be challenging. Okay. Well, 
Um, I think there's one more question. Um, how will this be monitored? How, we, how will we know the effects that um, releasing these mosquitoes is working? In addition, will hikers in the area be notified through signage? Kelly, do you want to talk a little bit about the work that you're doing currently to get a handle on mosquito populations? Right, so the, we will continue to do the kinds of research we have been doing with all those traps and, uh, and the larval surveys. So the, the work we're doing right now is two, is, has two objectives. One is to figure out where mosquitoes are in time and space so that we know how many males we need to release because we have to overwhelm the population with these lab reared males and you don't know how to overwhelm the population if you don't know how many females are out there right so our current research is trying to figure out how where mosquitoes are in, in time and space how many there are but it is also the baseline data against which we can monitor the success of this project because we'll go back uh, or and continue to monitor these same sites as we deploy these lab reared males and see if over time, we are catching fewer and fewer females, and whether we are finding fewer and fewer larvae in, spring, in the streams. Meanwhile, we have ongoing research where we sample the with a tiny, tiny blood draw. We sample the blood of the birds to find out if they have been infected by this blood parasite, avian malaria, and we will continue to determine if the levels of the parasite in bird blood are going down because that's the real end goal is to see that it's going down, the disease is going down, right? And we can monitor survival of the birds as well and see if we are having improvements in the survival trajectories of the birds or whether we're beginning to see areas repopulated with these birds where they weren't for a while. So we have lots and lots of different ways at different time scales and different spatial scales of monitoring the success of the project. And signage, that was the other question. Yeah. I think I think that's something being worked on, yeah? Julia. Yes, we are working, currently working on uh, coming up with some signage that uh, will be put out, um, hopefully uh, uh, statewide um, on all the islands um, to inform people Can about what's uh, going on here um, with the mosquitoes and what we are doing and, and, and about, about all the birds. But if the question is, will every single time there is a release, a sign go up? Probably not, because yeah, it is exactly. going to be so con re relatively continuous once it happens. I mean, it's going to be like, you know, every other Friday or <laughs> the last Friday of the month or whatever frequency we determine, but it is going to be an on- going project and it, there's no human impact. So there's no reason to put up like warning signs or whatever. It should be, if anything, celebratory signs like, woohoo, this area is having its mosquitoes controlled. <laughs> because, balloons, because, going because, up balloons. Uh, <laughs> well, we can make announcements, big. right? I mean, we can do that on Facebook. I mean, I think or, initially there will be announcements, yeah. but I think that as the project wears on, they're not going to announce on a weekly or bi-weekly or right. whatever. Yeah. So. yeah, I think because there's no really impact on humans, um, right. except for eventually, hopefully no more mosquitoes of that type. <laughs> yeah. So when you're at your cabin in Koke'e, are you noticing more mosquitoes? When you're at the Halau cabin in Koke'e? Oh, you... Yeah, there's more. Mm -hmm. There have been. Mm -hmm. We used to be, you know, years ago, you could go up there, no problem, there's still mosquitoes. We'd, we'd go up there just for that. One of the reasons to go there was to get away from the mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, there are ways in which you can help, and in, in your halal has already been so involved, but there, you, there will be public scoping meetings for the environmental assessments that go along with this procedure. And it would be wonderful if you turned up and and spoke up and um, similarly, because you do have a property up there, do regularly patrol it and make sure that you're not inadvertently creating breeding habitat. Uh, we, on a, 
you know, we're, we're, we're going to continue to need public support for activities and public involvement in activities. So like, that's why my slide says, stay involved, stay informed, because there's going to be a lot of steps along this road where public involvement is key. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say, Taya? Oh, absolutely. And that's why this, this kind of activity is so important is to help more people get the word out to, because it because it's complicated and it takes a while to understand. Uh, and we're still figuring out what are the best messages? How do we say this in a simple way that's accessible? For example, referring it referring to the mosquito probably as, as the house mosquito or southern house mosquito as opposed to culix and we you know how to even say quincofasciatas <laughs> if you're using more common names or just culix and the culix mosquito something that's simple so we're still we because we're so in in meshed and deep into this project we forget that terms that are common to us are are not easy for other other folks to understand so we definitely appreciate feedback um, so that we can help get the word out as most effectively as possible to the public not just and not you know of course we we hope for support but but it is a public process and so we want people to know more than anything we want people to be fully informed about any risks associated with it but also the risk of doing nothing because doing nothing is a choice as well. And it's not one any of us are comfortable with making, but people need to know that that is, that is a choice that's out there and what the result will be is that we will have no more forest birds, no more native forest birds. We plan on hosting a couple more of these. So another way is to spread the word and let people know that we're doing these and you know offering our time to answer questions yeah. And, uh, you know, again, like ask us the hard questions because the, like you're going to get asked the hard questions if you're talking about it with your neighbor. I mean, just this morning I was sharing with this gang here that an article came out earlier this week about the whole process. And my dad sent it to a colleague of his who immediately wrote back to my dad with a question that I couldn't answer, you know, like properly. And so that's going to happen. So we want to start now here, like hearing what it is you're, you, you want to know more about or what you're worried about or whatever, because you're gonna get those questions and we want you to help us you know, be an ambassador. <laughs> mm -hmm. How about the optic, I know mean, it's not mosquitoes, but you were talking about before about possibility of capturing the birds and then mm -hmm. taking them to Maui. Is that still going to be going on or what have you guys, have they decided? So, we have a proposal going forward. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? We're going, we have a proposal going to the Board of Land and Natural Resources on Friday to, uh, to get their approval to do so. And in fact, Dawn has submitted testimony mm -hmm. about that on our behalf. And um, I believe Keahi also will. Um, that's another example of how people can get involved and show their support for the bird is by getting involved in that uh, action. But the, the current plan is next month to catch five Akikiki from Halapakai where they're disappearing so quickly and, and take them to Maui before the mosquitoes get them basically. And, we, and, and we're getting board approval for that on Friday. Yeah. We hope, fingers crossed, the board approves it. And then will they be reintroduced back into Kauai or? That's the idea. The, the, the current recommended plan for Akikiki is to remove Akikiki from the wild, uh, at least some, uh, how, how many exactly is still TBD, but, and, and hold them and try to breed them in Maui. And then as soon as the Tuolbakia works in a couple of years, release them back to the wild, but we've been doing a bunch of modeling exercises with experts statewide over the last month. And um, I don't know how well it will show, but you know, it looks like Akikiki's time to extinction is like this and Wolbachia coming onto the landscape. Oops, my hands are going the other way. Like we basically expect Akikiki might go extinct the same year we finally get Wolbachia on the landscape. So we don't really have a choice but to bring them into captivity 
Um, and then hopefully within a couple of years, we can release them back because Wolbachia will be working on the landscape. Akake, on the other hand, we think has a lot more time. So it's not at all clear that we'll bring any more Akake into captivity. We're gonna probably continue to monitor them in the wild and basically hope that Wolbachia kicks in quickly and we'll be in time to save Akake because they are more numerous. Now, that being said, if Akake starts to crash the way Akikiki has lately, we will be having a different conversation, but that's the, that's the tenure of the conversation right now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe you're, so if this goes ahead, by the way, I believe that um, I've asked Keahi if she will do a blessing for our expedition um, on November 29th to collect the Akikiki. I need to circle back to her. The, I've, well, Julia's talked to one and I have talked to two Kumu so far who have been supportive um, of, of this plan. All right. It really, it really speaks to the urgency of where we are. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, we will send you uh, the recording and the slides and some um, informational and an infographic and our Zoom backgrounds that showcase the different native forest birds that you can use for the next time you zoom in. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you so Thank you. much. Okay. Bye. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.